Oh, Ladies, minutes. we're live. Okay. okay, yeah, we're live. So now that we're back after lunch, we're going to pick up at 6.0. We're moving on with our deferred items. 6.1 is policy eight. It's our board committee's policy. Um, this has come to us. This will be our, our third time now having a look at this. We should be ready, putting it on the table for final approval. So looking just specifically at policy eight, we'll do the appendixes separately. Are there any last comments on policy eight? There's no comments. There's someone who would like to make a motion. Trustee Islander. Oh, motion to approve policy eight. All in favor? Carried. Policy eight appendix A is where we've written out the uh, details of the terms of reference from policy <coughs> eight. We reviewed this at our cow meeting and all the changes that were brought forward at the cow meeting have been updated in here. So if there are, if there are any concerns, let us know. Otherwise, a motion to approve policy eight appendix A. Um, yes. Trustee Eckert, motion to approve policy eight appendix A. Is that an in favor or a question? Oh, no, that's it. in favor. Sorry. Sorry. Nope. Yeah. I just want to make sure. All in favor? Carried. Policy eight, appendix B is a new one. This is the description, find it here, information for the audit committee public members. There were no changes to this one when it came forward to our second viewing at Cal. If everyone is still good with this, then we can go ahead and approve it. There was, there was a question about the part on... Uh, I think that's in Appendix C. C. Oh, is that Appendix C? Okay, yeah. sorry, my bad. Motion to approve Appendix B. Trustee Steed. All in favor? Carried. Now with policy eight, appendix C, when we discussed this at our Cal meeting, we did have one question about uh, the term of the non-disclosure period um, in number three. And we have um, consulted the lawyers on this and there is some more information. So, I'm, I'm going to recommend just because we want to make sure that we get this right before we move forward, that we defer this one to our August meeting so we have some time to review the information that the lawyer sent and make sure we've got it right. Does that seem fair? Mm -hmm. Okay, so we'll defer policy eight appendix C to the August board meeting. <coughs> okay. And the last policy to look at is policy 19, our welcoming, caring, respectful, safe, and healthy learning and working environments. Changes to policy 19 is that we moved the preamble from the student code of conduct appendix to the end of policy 19 with a reference to AP 350. And we're going to leave the student code of conduct as an AP rather than have it as appendix to policy. And then it will be aligned when the uh, parent code of conduct falls in there as well. Okay. So if everyone's good with that and motion to approve policy 19, Trustee Opsky, all in favor? And with that, because we're removing the 
uh, policy 19 appendix. Can we get a motion to approve putting the student code of conduct, removing it as a policy? It's moving to staying in the AP and we'll remove it as a policy appendix. That makes sense. Trustee Seed. Sorry, which is part of, what is this motion? Policy 19 uh, appendix. Oh, the, the previous right. appendix, the student code of conduct, just officially removing that as a policy of yeah. And I'll do it. Yeah, because it's already exists as AP 350. All in favor? Carried. Thank you for that. Six point six is our last stage of our ward review process. So I will turn it over to Superintendent Romanchuk for an update on the survey. So I shared the preliminary results with you at the count meeting. Um, since that time, I think we have had about three or four more responses to the uh, three or four more responses to the poll. Um, I think this went from 65.3 to 65.9. So that was the only discernible change that we had and they are going for option B. So to review option A was to follow the county board structure. Um, in this one, there was uh, representation by population, which was even across the board felt within the parameters. Um, <clears throat> We did find with this one um, that there was a larger area here for County West, which would include Warburg, Thorsby, and the town of Kalmar. And we would also find that the current ward here, County Center Devon, would become one ward realized that Beaumont and New Sarepta would become a ward and that Leduc, everything outside of, everything uh, west of Beaumont and south of Airport Road would also be part of Leduc. So that coincided with the county, county boundaries. There were three county wards here, one here, two here, and I think one here as well. So that worked out, that was, that would make it very easy for the electioneering. Um, I provided you with all of the raw comments um, all the way through. And there were no new comments for this section um, on the, since the last time we looked at it, which was at the cow meeting. Option B was basically by high school attendance area. And so in the West, that would be Warburg and Thorsby's high school attendance area, Kalmar and Devon's attendance area, Leduc Composites attendance area, and Beaumont Composites attendance area. So we went by attendance area. The benefit to this is that the uh, parents would be voting for the trustee where their students went to school. So they would have familiarity in that regard. Now we did recognize that this also had a smaller ward in the West. So there would be less travel for that particular trustee. We also indicated that the number of schools per trustee would be a little more equal in this setup than in the previous one. We also recognize that the area to the west in Warburg and Thorsby would not meet the criteria for representation by population. And it wouldn't, it would, that area would be overrepresented. And given the population trends moving into the future, it would probably continue to be overrepresented in the, in the election following the next one. Again, all of the comments are here. I did receive, I believe there was one more comment that I put on the end. Um, 
and I've added it to this document, which will be, oh, sorry, it's not that one, it's right here. Um, that was in this, in this area. We also captured other opportunities for people to give feedback where they made suggestions on possible other words. And you've had you know, at least a week to study these. Um, and they've all been given to you in raw form. So from a administrative point of view, I think at this point you have a couple of options. One, administration is going to suggest that we're going to recommend option B as the, as the option moving forward. Um, I've been in contact with the local returning officers in Beaumont, the Duke, Devon, and Thorsby, and, or sorry, Calmar, just to double check to see that we could do this in terms of uh, like the vote would be able to, to happen. It wouldn't be complicated. Um, it would just mean that there would be two returning officers that would have to provide information to, um, to Black Gold and the Associate Superintendent of Business and Finance is our returning officer. So it would be a little more complicated for her to basically, she'd, be, she'd not only be working with the returning officer from the County of Leduc to get the word structure, but to determine the word structure, but also with the other municipalities. And in talking with those municipalities, they, they were grateful for the heads up and said, yeah, this isn't going to be a problem. So it's a little relieved on that part of it. Um, the board can accept the recommendation. The board can suggest that we go back to the, can make another, re a different recommendation. The board can say we go back and start all over again. So here's some discussion, I guess. Questions, comments? Does this have to be done? I'm sorry. No, it's Does this have to be done and finalized? It has to be. It has to be in by December. In December. Yes. Including the completion of the bylaw. Right. The bylaws. Well, I think we've done a lot of, well, well thank you for one, Bill, we've uh, done a lot of work with this and I really appreciate it. And I, I think that um, what has been presented are, are really the, the best options for, for what we are given. And, and for, for me, um, I think um, option B is uh, the best option for, for us um, because of the attendance boundaries, the distance of schools, and yes, of course, I'm I'm totally happy with being overrepresented in my area, but but it also makes but on a whole it still makes sense to me, um, and and I think that it'll it'll uh, I think it'll be really good for our community. Trustee Martinson, um, I think option B serves all of Blackwell well, and just like uh, Shauna or Trustee Ossie said. I mean, it's an area where it's not going to meet the rep by pop in probably years to come, but because of the distance between schools and so on and coming to central office for meetings and stuff, I think it's well representative. Um, I was just thinking now, where do we go from here? If we talk with the uh, different municipalities to get the message out to all of the parents on our Blackwood website that this is what's happening. And so, I mean, I've heard me, for many years, when it comes to voting, people get mixed or don't know where to go vote. They say to go vote somewhere, and then you go there, and they say, well, no, you can't vote here, just to make sure that everybody knows this is what's going on, and tell them or make sure they know where to go to vote. So so I did I did have a meeting with the people from the county of Leduc. Uh, that was my first stop. Um, before we even presented these, August, uh, to the public just to make sure that we could do these uh, so that if, if we weren't asking for something and couldn't be done, they said yes, it probably can happen. Um, I know there were some, I'm not sure what the issues were, but I heard there were some issues in, in uh, Beaumont last year, and I know that there, we have a new 
we, we have a new uh, returning officer in Beaumont. Um, and so when I discussed this with her, she said, yes, we can definitely do this. Um, so I'm feeling, I'm feeling uh, much better after those conversations. I feel confident that we won't have issues with like that. And I think we'll have these conversations right up until election time. And also, I and this is kind of just came into my head. I think you know, with the changes on how how people can vote, because now separates or Catholics can now vote for public school board trustees. Maybe they need to be aware of that, because I know when I used to go campaigning, people would say, "I'd really like to vote for you. I got my kids going to your school, but I can't vote for you because I'm Catholic." And just to jump in on that. <coughs> that my understanding is that that's going to be a big focus of some of the advocacy work that ASBA does this year as well. So hopefully we can piggyback on that and, and really get that message out to our constituents. I have a question slash comment. And um, so you referenced bylaws. Are those black gold bylaws or are those municipal bylaws? Black gold bylaws. So attached to policy seven is the bylaw. Attached. Um, and what the bylaw what the bylaw states is basically it outlines the work. Okay. Um, it gives the legal description of where the wards are, the number of trustees in each ward. Okay, thank you. Um, so that kind of leads into my other comment, um, and it just pertains to the areas with multiple trustees. As I've mentioned this before, I think it makes sense to consider um, finding a strategy to um, create primary contacts within areas where there are multiple trustees so that there isn't a duplication of efforts. And so that not to say you can't go to a different event at a different school, but to say that these four schools or three schools are your primary contacts and these are who you work with. So I think it would be if we can in our best interest of effectiveness to have that included in our bylaw, if that's the right place or the policy. Otherwise, I think, um, Option B seems to create the most equal distribution, which is our, our work. The number of schools is a lot of what our work has to do with, right? I think it's a good approach. So within policy seven, it does, and under number one, it does talk about the various words and stuff like that um, in layman's terms. So if you wanted to add something like that, um, maybe propose that to the policy committee, the policy committee can work on that and bring it back to the board for approval. And I think that's something that just should be worked out with the trustees if there's new or a few trustees in different areas because in the city of Ladoo, you're elected at large. You're not elected for East Ladoo, West Ladoo, South Ladoo or whatever. So you represent all of the city. So I think, you know, just because you say, or I'm in charge, or I represent Ladoo Composite High School, that shouldn't prevent the other trustee from going to the grad or to the award ceremony. Of course, course not. No, I meant more primary contact for like announcements for those meetings. Yeah, and that can be worked out. I don't think it has to be written policies that worked out. I, correct me if I'm wrong. What I'm interpreting from what you're saying is that we would write into policy that that process would happen amongst the trustees right. within that ward, not necessarily that trustee A, trustee B, trustee C, these are your schools, yes. but that Correct. each term, the trustees from that ward would figure out yeah. what the split looks like and, and how it works best for them. So. Correct. And you'll notice in both scenarios, A and B, that it's both a rural and an urban representation so that even though we are primarily, let's say within the boundary of the Duke, that includes a lot of the rural residents therein, and the same with Beaumont, which previously were simply within the municipality of those cities. So this is a this is a major departure from what major departure from what the board has had before. Um, I I just want to comment on that. We we started this process. There were multiple scenarios that have been weeded down to get us to these two. And um, I think some really good work was brought into this to bring us to two scenarios that could both serve Black Gold well. I will support what, what other people have commented and the recommendation from administration that um, option B, I appreciate that while Rep by Pop is a key 
factor for us to look at and that that is the the primary target that we're looking at there are other factors that come into play in how we do our work and how we serve our population and and you know we heard from our community engagement sessions that the rural representation was important and um, you know we know what our connections with our schools mean in serving how we work um, so I appreciate that that we're looking at all of those variables and trying to balance out the best of them in our decision. Is someone wanting to put a motion <coughs> on the table? Trustee Upstein? I will make that motion to um, have option B. Uh, I don't know how to word it, sorry. <laughs> Whatever the motion. To change our ward boundaries to option B. So the representation for it, and you want to stipulate that as well? The representation? The, How many uh, trustees would be serving in each area? Or? Sorry? The number of trustees that are serving in each area. So there is one in, the, in this area. There is one for this area. There are three for this area. And there are two for this area. Two for Beaumont New Sarepta, three for the Duke, one for Calmar Devon, one for Warburg Thorsby. So what it's doing is it is it is bringing more into line the representation for the urban areas, um, much more so than they are right now. And they all meet all of the all of the wards except for the far west meet the representation by population. Okay, so we have a motion on the table for um, approving option B as the new ward structure for Black Gold School Division effective October comes into effect when the next election happens, correct? So October 2021, when the election at the election. I'm going to trust that Sandy's got the wording on that one figured out. This is substantive. Do we want to have a recorded vote? Yes. Recorded vote? Okay, let's do a recorded vote. All in favor? Opposed? Motion is carried. Thank you to administration for the work on that process and for the for the input from the consultant who got us up to speed on all of the background information on that. All right, moving on with our agenda, we have 7.1. I'm assuming this is you, Superintendent Romanchuk, the new Humble Center School update. Sorry. <clears throat> so uh, very similar to the update I gave last week at Cal. Um, and at that point, sorry, at the previous board, um, at the previous board meeting, you asked for an update on the on the process as well as where we are in the process. So talked about the talking about the charter school process, uh, basically a three-step process. I've been in contact with Maurice Trotje, who is uh, title is field services manager. But he is the person that oversees all of the charter school applications. So the first process was to ask the current school division to provide an alternative program. We declined that. We declined to uh, provide an alternative program to keep New Humble School open. Second part is to submit an application. And what I did is I've just provided this straight out of um, straight out of the uh, the regulation so that those, those steps are there. And my understanding is that the, this particular part, step two, is currently on the um, Assistant Deputy Minister's desk for approval. Um, once that becomes approved, then there is the third and final step, which uh, says that another application and these particular criteria need to be, um, need to be addressed. 
So in the first criteria, you'll notice that there's a projected enrollment grade distribution. And currently, I believe the projected enrollment is for 45 students. I believe they have 30 that are confirmed and I believe 40, another, another 25 or so that are on the maybe list. And so their projection is um, 45. That's, what, that's the information that was shared with me. I have not verified that with anyone from the New Humble group. So um, we'll take that as, we'll take that as uh, in that context. Um, according to Mr. Trache, the New Humble group has an excellent um, chance of being successful with their application. They are working very hard. They are working with uh, the people at Alberta Education and uh, are following the guidelines and are, are working within those guidelines. Um, the other thing that he had talked about, and I think I had mentioned at our committee meeting, was that there is a good chance that this particular uh, application may be expedited. So usually it's about a three three month process before the step one and two, so probably four month process to make that happen. They could theoretically be ready for September of 2020. Um, we don't know. We don't know what what's going to happen in that regard. Uh, we believe there is a will amongst the people in government to move this forward at a faster pace. You said it's not common, but it is not unprecedented to expedite something like this. My conversations with uh, Mr. Trache and also with people from Albert Infrastructure is, I think as a board, we would like to have this process expedited the sooner we know better the, the board would very much like to work with the new humble the new humble group these are our students after all or will be our students at some point um, the other part is is that there is a liability to black gold in terms of the building and the playground um, and we would like to we would like to we would like to have a little more certainty and a little less risk around that um, we do know that the charter school will have no attendance boundary. Um, and the, in their initial letter, probably about a month ago, uh, they did ask if they, could, uh, if they could speak to somebody from transportation. And we said, absolutely. And gave them Sue's uh, contact information and they actually did send a letter this morning uh, to Sue asking to have a meeting and see about collaborating on, uh, on busing back and forth. So. Uh, I had to change this this morning because I had it as of yesterday, there was nothing. Um, just to let you know, the teach teachers would not, um, employed by our charter school are not full ATA members. Um, support staff do not need to be part of the union. Um, and charter schools, of course, do have to follow the Education Act and all related regulations. Um, and they do receive full funding for students. Um, again, I contacted uh, Alberta Infrastructure and as you yesterday, it's on the, the status of the building and property are on the assistant deputy minister's desk. So there was, there has been no news since my last update at the committee meeting last week. Um, I think you did, and Ruth, I think you might have, this might be in your report as well, but um, this is what we shared earlier with uh, the board in terms of what the costs are going to be to have the school decommissioned. Um, and we did find out a little more information as far as insurance goes, but part of that is we're going to have to do evaluation of the building and so on. So um, that's, that's for board information. Are there any questions on that? Trustee Martins. No, the question is clarification. When I was reading about charter schools, I thought there was a minimum number of 100 students. That doesn't, I mean, now with this price of education, you can have any number you want and start so a charter the, school wherever? The regulation does say that. There is a minimum of 100 or the second clause they that follows that it. says or something that program or curriculum. Uh, programming that it can be proved to be viable. So so that is, so that's, that's their own. Yeah. Sorry, and I apologize if I missed this. I was just curious, did you say or have an estimation of roughly the timeline we're looking for for information on the disposition? 
We don't have a timeline. Okay. Uh, originally, they had told me within four to five weeks of it hitting the of the application being made. As of yesterday, it's still on the ADM's desk, so I don't know. Okay. Thanks. And these are just some, sort of some unknowns. So, so they set up a charter school. What if they can't find teachers? Actually, part of the process is they have to provide the the uh, certification number of the teachers that are going to be in the in the school. So they need to have that all a commitment it. prior to. That's correct. I don't think they have to provide teachers right now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Any other questions? If you scroll back down to the expenses, is there anything there that reflects someone from Black Gold driving past the property to make sure that it hasn't been breached? No. Like City of Edmonton has people who drive around to vacant properties to make sure that they haven't been breached. And yeah, each school does have an alarm system. But but our insurers do require once a week a check. So that you, you are talking. correct in that. And I think what we would have to do is build it into the maintenance schedules as perhaps they're on their way to, you know, some of the other schools and just uh, make sure that we have that that drop in, which is required. Sure. Just wanted to make sure that yeah. would be overlooked. Yeah. No, it, it does need to be done. And just one more question. So when you have a charter school, you have a superintendent for some so where would they fall under do they fall under some other superintendent that's taking care of other chart or do we know that or do we, do we, do we the short answer is no i don't know the answer to that um, most charter schools their superintendent is a would be a point ft so in other words yeah point two ft so you know and of course the, the the government does have their pay band. So within that pay band, and this would be, of course, the lowest pay band, a 0.2 FTE, for example, of a superintendent. They have a superintendent name, that person is, is doing that work for, on behalf of that school. Does he have to visit the school? I'm sorry? Does he have to visit the school? I would hope so. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just wondering. Um, there's no other questions. Is there a specific ask that you need from us at this point? I don't think so. Have we, uh, have we has uh, Tomer Elementary gone in and gotten everything that they need out? And so what's remaining is going to remain or how does that? So according to our report, we have distributed property according to our administrative procedures. Um, we did say that Calmer Elementary is going to get the students, so we probably get first dibs on all of the equipment. We did a full inventory of all the equipment that's there. Uh, so between Calmar Elementary and Calmar um, Secondary, they got the, the lion's share. We now open it up to other um, schools within Black Gold, and then our AP says that it has to go out to public. From the public. Okay, I'm yeah. thinking specifically um, uh, personal memorabilia, like the, the photos of, you know, the humble and the uh, game, um, plaques, mm -hmm. and so uh, the dish on the I'm getting questions from kids, from alumni. So, in consideration of that, I mean, we at first we thought we would have a committee, I think I, I talked to you about that, where would this go? But now since the charter school is there, at this point we've left everything where it is. If the charter school application is successful, I would suggest that maybe the board would want to leave that with the building. If the charter school application is not successful, then um, in talking with the principal of uh, Calmar Elementary, Maybe that material could be transferred to Calmar Elementary so that it's not lost, so that it is a visible reminder of the heritage in that area. So at this point, we're leaving it. 
and we're going to wait on the disposition. Okay. I know one of the things we talked about when we talked about the building itself, the sale, but it would, you know, first choice would go out to the new humble community. Have we heard anything like, or will the government be able to say, you know what, they're setting up a charter school, you have, you have to give it to them? Or what, how does that? So my comment when I talked to Alberta Infrastructure, the, I was asked the question. And uh, the question was, can I put down that the board is okay with giving this to New Humble Center School? Uh, I can't remember what the exact word was. It wasn't donating. But, um, and, and my response at the time was no. Um, the board has been the board has been responsible for maintaining the school. Has put a lot of money into the school. Um, the board should be given the choice as to what they want to do. If the school would be valued at a million dollars, for example, and the board chose to sell it to the New Humble Group for market value, well below market value, a dollar, that should still be the choice of this board. Mm -hmm. This board should have some say mm -hmm. in that. So I said, that would be, that would be my recommendation. I'm not going to say that yes, the board said, yeah, you can have it. Because mm -hmm. I don't think that's, I don't think that is the will of the board. I didn't have time to pull anybody. Yeah. Um, the other thing that I did share last time was that uh, the Duke County, had, when I had gone and had the conversation about electoral boundary boards, they had said, what do we do with people who ask, um, who are inquiring about purchasing New Humble School? And I said, well, then send them to me. I said, because we have had a couple of inquiries. Now, I don't know if that was from people within the Humble area or anything else. Um, since that time, I have not had any, no one is in one. So if that were the case, though, I would let them know that this board, and I'm from our conversation at the committee last week, would probably not want to entertain a sale anytime soon until you find out the disposition of the new home. Am I correct in that? And I just hope that that new humble community knows that it's just not we're going to sign it off to them for. And that, that is the decision of the board. So I, I hope the board has that Step opportunity to make the choice. No further questions? Thank you. Okay, Associate Superintendent Darji, 8.1 International Travel and School Excursions. Thank you, Madam Chair, and through the trustees and administration. <laughs> Um, international travel and domestic trips, and by domestic trips, I'm talking about trips that are within, Can uh, within Canada that require board approval. Um, they obviously provide valuable learning experiences for our students. Uh, with this being said, we're still in, um, we're still dealing with the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, the government of Canada still has travel advisories out Alberta has um, also identified that official global travel advisory is still in effect and non-essential travel outside of Canada is, is not recommended. Next year, we, well, next school year, we have um, two uh, trips that have already received uh, approval in principle. There's one trip uh, from Thorsby and Warburg School, Thorsby High School and, and Warburg School for grade to 10 grade 10 to 12 students that wish to um, travel to France and Italy on March 25th to April 5th, 2021. And then we also have a second uh, trip that was received approval in principally called Secondaire de Beaumont Comte High School, grades 10 through 12, trip to Italy and Greece in July 2nd and 13th, which would be next summer. Um, the schools, uh, we also have schools um, that have annual trips, domestic trips. Um, some of the trips that come to mind are the Quebec trips um, that a lot of our French immersion schools are, are offering. Um, in light of um, the travel advisories from the government of, of Canada and the provincial government, um, 
we'd like to put forward a recommendation for consideration to the trustees um, that the safety and the physical, uh, physical and well, and physical and mental well-being of students, staff members, or staff and members of our community, is always at the forefront of all decisions. And given the travel advisories associated with the COVID-19 pandemic and the combined public health information being released, administration recommends that the board considers canceling all international and domestic trips that require board approval for the 2020-2021 school year, including July and August of next summer. Um, why the entire year? Um, as I mentioned before, student safety and well-being is, is paramount. The travel advisories are still in place. Uh, much planning and fundraising is still occurring um, that we, you know, that, uh, for these trips that require board approval. Some of these schools, as I mentioned, uh, the domestic trips that are being planned, the fundraising will be commencing shortly, shortly if not have already commenced even before board approval. Um, what we're looking for is some clarity uh, to provide to, to our schools uh, moving forward for the duration of the year next year. So as I mentioned, um, the administration is, is looking for a direction, and possibly a board motion to look at canceling trips, domestic and international trips um, that require board approval for the entire year next year. I feel like we spent a lot of time on international travel. Questions? Just, I just, I'm so reluctant. I, and I get it. And I, I know we almost have our hands tied and have no choice. I, because uh, I, I think it's so important to, to learning and so important to our, to, to our kids. But yes, it has to happen. Martinson. I'd like to make that motion that we cancel all international and domestic field trips for now. And if I could just speak to that motion. Yes, please. And I think just like we talked earlier this morning about sports teams and so on and so forth, there's always community sports or, I mean, they, they could get into different things. And it's just like, and I think having field trips with schools is a valuable experience, but there are also travel aid or travel things that you can your student or a student can go on to those as well and I think right now for this COVID I don't I what if there is a second wave I don't want to put any child and everybody's getting you know antsy to get things going but I would for me I would rather be safe than sorry that's just my trustee Steed um obviously nobody would like to choose this route but I think it is the most sensible route it has to be consideration given to parents and the students sooner rather than later because there is also a lot of work and involvement from the family for fundraising, for their own financial contributions. So I think it's important we, we, we can't just delay this and make a decision later. Unfortunately, I think we do have to be, make the decision now on in everybody's best interest that this year is not the year that we can permit any international travel. A year, a whole year, yeah, I guess so. But anything can happen, you know, things can change, right? So, do we have the option of if by a blessed miracle we're uh, we have no second wave, there is no more pandemic, we have the vaccine, everybody's happy in six months? Can we go back and say? Well, it, come, it comes back to the, I guess you could wave that. The practical aspect is it goes back to the fundraising. It goes back, there's two parts to it. It goes back to the planning and the fundraising and how much time is necessary to do all of that. And, and it will take a number of months. They've done a whole bunch of it. They have. The second part comes down is that if the board makes this motion, the schools then are going to go and talk to the insurance company and say, our board is canceled, we, we need our money back. So at that point, you can't go back on it. So the board could go back and say, yeah, we're gonna open it up again, but I think those trips are done. Okay. Yeah. 
Jill Gorman. Thanks. Uh, I'm in agreement of the putting it off in light of the fundraising and the planning. But my question is about the fundraising that has been done to date. I saw in there that roughly $400 will be lost with the non-refundable deposit and insurance. But what if they've earned or fundraised more money? Where, where will that go? And can they somehow retain that for their own? You now we have administrative procedure 520 and Pass over to you. Well, just something came in actually about an hour ago. Warburg uh, staff is asking that very same question. Uh, and because parents will be out in the information I've got here, a certain amount uh, they paid, this is probably the same as yours, uh, they lose 195 non refundable admin fee and possibly insurance premium of 180. So, what the school is asking uh, us to do is to use fundraising money to uh, reimburse the parents for the amounts that they're out and so we're in the process depending on what you decide today uh, of doing that uh, you know so that they would it's unusual but everything's unusual in, in this year and I, I recall we have done that once before as well uh, use some fundraising uh, dollars to um, reimburse the parents for the non-refundable and there is enough there to do that. I believe uh... Beaumont Comp's trip is very similar, that there is a, a $200 non-refundable uh, deposit and a $189 insurance fee that goes along with that. So I'm not sure where they're at. I'm not fundraising? sure if there's any fundraising associated with that or how much fundraising has been associated with that trip. So, so once the board makes your decision, then we'll, we'll follow up on things. But if, at Warburg, they're already planning for that, I think. <laughs> Is that a separate motion, though? Don't, that we like? Do we need to have it? No, administratively, we'll look at. We'll look okay. after it. Yeah. I think it, I don't know. I if I were a parent and I had a child that was going on one of these trips, I think I'd rather know now than two months before the trip. I don't. Know. That was the uh, sentiment echoed by some of the supervisors as well in my conversations with them. And then I think it takes a lot of stress off of off of the teacher supervisors that are going in as well. So they know that they can you know, carry on and do whatever else they have to do besides planning on a field trip and then it's not really happening on a trip. We, we all know how being in limbo can be very stressful. And so I think it is, it is nice to plan ahead even though it's, it's that I'm reluctant, but I, I do appreciate it's unfortunate, but there are, there will be lots of things for our staff to focus on yeah. rather than, than, than planning process of trips that may or may not happen. I do hope that international travel does come back on our agenda again in the future sooner rather than later. But in the meantime, are we ready to call the question? All in favor of suspending international travel for the Cancelling international travel for the 2020-2021 school year. Specifically international travel and domestic travel domestic that requires uh, travel that requires a board approval. So domestic travel that requires board approval. All in favor? Carried. So thank you. And I mean, as, as Bill mentioned earlier, and we'll continue to monitor the travel advisories and public health information to help guide the board on looking at decisions beyond this moratorium. So, yeah. Oh, yes. The next one. So the additional information. Yeah, yeah so the additional information um, at this point, prior to me talking a little bit about extracurricular activities, um, I would ask uh, Superintendent Monty if he can uh, do you want to do these first? No, just follow it up after. Oh, that, that works. Sure, go ahead. Okay. okay. So, um, moving forward as well, um, there are other excursions that do happen that require um, my, my approval or administration approval and school principal approval. And uh, I'm presenting this as information to the board. Um, that administration is, is recommending. Um, that admin are recommending to, to all the principals 
that excursions be postponed and reviewed in November. So when I say postponed, um, we're talking overnight trips, we're talking uh, any trips that require any type of uh, transportation using uh, buses, um, all those types of other excursions that do not require board approval, that require administration or principal approval. We are saying that uh, we are going to be recommending to the principal principals uh, that we postpone these. Um, and we'll review it in November. Also, uh, you want me to continue on with the extracurricular call or? No, so then I'll follow it up. Okay. Yeah. So the, the extracurricular activities as well. When we talk about extracurricular activities, um, we're talking sports, we're talking any of the artist activities, um, whether it be, um, I don't know, uh, presentations of drama performances, etc. Um, administration, once again, is recommending to all principals that these activities be postponed and reviewed in November as well. Um, once again, there's all of the transportation that goes along with this. Um, we want to make sure that we're emphasizing student safety. We have uh, come off uh, several months here of remote learning. And we have uh, huge tasks ahead of us to work with students. It looks like we're going to go with uh, option number one, where students are going to be attending our, our schools. The implementation of all the safeguards associated with that, there is uh, much to focus on from the well being of our students. So, we would like to really focus on that in the first several months of school. So, I wanted to present this to, to the board as information that um, not only did we ask for or for motion for international and domestic trips, but we will also be, um, when it comes to providing these types of opportunities for students, we just want to put those on hold for now. So at this point, I'm going to pass over to the so, handsome, charming, to Associate Superintendent Monty <laughs> to talk you. to you about some uh, documents that we'll be sharing with the public and with administration. Bill, do you want to jump back to the other document first, Dave? The general one. General one. The one that's this one. Yeah. Perfect. So, uh, Madam Chair, the trustees, the senior admin right now is using all of these documents. The you know one from uh, the GOA, the Q and A about communications and public engagement, uh, COVID nineteen. That document. We are also using the twenty twenty one school entry document, and then the two. Uh, appendices from that document, the um, school reentry scenario one, scenario two. So we've taken all this stuff and we've created two documents. They're still kind of in draft. We want to get you know, this show them to them. We'll tie them up here today, tomorrow morning. So this first document, it will go and we talk about it at Cal. We, you were asking, let's, let's get something out to parents and families about what's going on. So this first one is, is more general, going out to I guess we'll run it by our admin first, maybe tomorrow morning, just to see if there's any tweaks. But then there'll be postage shared with all of our families, our staff, principals, everybody. And basically, it just talks about where we are now and where we're going. So, you know, the first, the very first paragraph just talked about um, um, Albert had released the reentry plan here on June 10th. Um, so, uh, Black Gold is going to follow their lead and have three scenarios. It talks about Scenario one, two, and three, with scenario one being the near normal piece and, and going from there. Um, we spoke about Black Gold's guiding principles um, somewhere up there. Our guiding principles, again, safety, well being of all of our students and staff, and learning will continue, and, and parents are the primary decision makers of their children. You know, some parents may choose not to return to school. So, Black Gold will have responsibilities supporting those children moving forward as well. That's that piece. Uh, the next piece just simply speaks about um, flat world following all Alberta health and GOA um, rules and regulations. You know, daily screening, in one of these documents, they provided all school boards with a uh, questionnaire that we need to supply all parents, teachers, staff, everybody. Um, before you go to school in the morning, you go to that questionnaire, and if you answer yes to any of those questions, do you feel sick? Do you have a fever? Have you been? You answer yes, then no going to school that day. Immediately, you have to go to the uh, online AHS assessment tool. 
do the assessment, follow the you know the, the process from there. So it just so that section talks about that kind of stuff, and we're going to do enhanced cleaning in our schools and and the physical distancing as much as possible, and all that is is basically all these documents. But rather than having four separate documents for families and staff to read through, we've taken the most important pieces and and put them in here. And I think we reviewed that we reviewed a referred sorry to some of those documents as well in this document. Um, what else? Um, and then we speak about scenario one, basically, you know, the near normal. Um, again, children and students will be supported for at home learning if a parent requests that happens and the parent is, is uncomfortable sending um, <coughs> the child to school. Uh, provincial assessments or the diploma exams mandatory still. Grade six and PTs uh, will continue as the previously established protocol. Just talks about that kind of stuff. Transportation, um, and of course, Sue spoke with us a while back here. She and her group of, of Alberta transportation stuff, and with the GOA and, and, and uh, Alberta is still looking at specifics. We have a couple of things there about you know fixed seating plans, uh, sitting with families, um, you know buses sanitized all the time. There's talk right now, and I'm not sure if this can happen. I, I think it can, but there's talk about you know, loading from the back and loading from the front. Usually right now you they load and unload you know, little you know the little ones sitting in the front if you the tenth child picked up the older ones sit in the back but there's some talk about you know to limit you know the, the contact as you get on the bus you go to the back as you get off you know look in the front so that sort of stuff is still um, in the works with transportation and then talk about scenario two scenario two all of the safeguards in scenario one are exactly the same for scenario two there's just going to be fewer kids. How will that look? We're not quite sure yet. We're going to take some of Elbert Ed's lead. You know, maybe you know half a class. Is it one week on, one week off? Is it you know, Monday, Monday, Tuesday cohort, or Thursday, Friday, and Wednesday's the cleaning day in between? We don't know that yet, but all the safety things would still be exactly the same. And then scenario three is basically what we've been doing now with our learning. Uh, and then I guess on the last page. What's on there? I guess the last section about looking ahead, right? And and there we just speak about again following Dina Henshaw's lead, the, the chief medical officer, and Alfred Ed, and um, I guess lastly encouraging uh, folks to have their kids, if possible, walk to school. Like if, if a lot of parents you know, may not want to ride the bus is it, for whatever reason, we all probably can't drive as well. That'd be a traffic jam too. So that sort of stuff. So. But government is saying, and look, you know, they're really pushing scenario one, and we do all the safety precautions in, and we have to do two or three will be nimble, flexible, and so we just wanted to get something out there on, on all of the black holes we have to parents, just so they have an idea of where we're going with this. And then there's a second document, a little more specific for administrators, that I'll talk about in a second. But any, now I say this is still. Semi draft. We hope to tweak it later today and then share the principles tomorrow and do the final tweaking. And I guess Norm would post it on the website. We might we send it out through Messenger. I'm not sure yet. So we just draw that. Questions comments? Yeah. Um, anyway, I was just going to say this was a different problem, and this was even before my time. Be before I became a trustee, but I remember the problem was there was no room in the inn. So so was asked to speak. So then yeah. they had kids in church basements and and so on and so forth, or even dip uh, different schedules, an early schedule and a late schedule for the day. But that was a different problem. But they worked with the churches and stuff to get everybody to come to school the same day, sort of a thing. So I don't know if that's something that you know. We might work with different communities if, if that would work as well. I mean, there's just a whole bunch of different things to consider. Different but similar. Mm -hmm. It just seems like a very huge administratively um, is going to take a lot of time. And it's, uh, especially, you know, having to go through these every single day. And I really appreciate get our, our staff because they're going to have a lot more work. And, um, yeah. And, and I think that's a good reason why the recognition of you know, 
cancelling field trips for a year. And mm -hmm. There's, there's, there's lots of other things place. to yeah. focus on. I mean, number one, we talked this morning, mental health. Our mm -hmm. kids have been not alone, but you know, basically cooped up for how many months. But we're social beings. We have, they're, they're just a whole mental health piece of getting kids back. And is it rushing curriculum or is it loving kids and taking care of the person so in the curriculum? There's just all those things that we need to focus on. So you've got teachers and, and staff, support staff, everyone will be. So that's the one document. And, and then here Bill showed this. Yeah, this is the, the questionnaire that the principals will have to get to all their, their staff. The Norms department will send is sending out via messenger to all of our parents. So that's it. And 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 you answer yes to any of these. You don't go to school that day. Instead, AHS and online assessment, and, and then follow the lead of the AHS after that. You answer yes to them. You don't get into the bank. Yeah, no, I say the same thing. Or the dentist. And the second document Bill is going to bring up, uh, we're going to share this one with the principals. Some of the same stuff and a little more specific from these documents. You know, do parents need, I mean, if they want to go, we'll read the documents themselves, but they don't need all that nitty gritty. So we give them more of a general. And then, uh, and what we do, we put some categories so principals know who's in charge of certain things. So you know, the documents talk about facilities ensuring that, you know, the schools haven't been used well for the past few months. So just making sure HVAC, water lines, all that's kind of flashed and everything, and everything's healthy and ready to go. So um, Rob Cron and his team are all on that. They're aware of that kind of stuff. And just a reminder, water fountains do remain open in our pandemic plan we created back months ago. And in all this stuff, they're recommending water fountains stay open. If you have the newer style with the water bottle filter, that's the best. If you have the old style, just make sure when's cleaning a high-tech service or use a paper towel when you push the button to fill your fountain. The one concern was with little children, sometimes they're drinking from it, they put their mouth right around the, the silver stuff. So of course we're gonna have to have our teachers of younger kids and supports of younger ones, maybe fill their water bottles up for them, that kind of thing. Um, but the recommendation is leave them, leave them ready. Uh, for principals, just the list from these documents, basically of any of those soft pipe services that can easily be cleaned, easily be cleaned, which is probably all of them, like whether it's a, a teddy bear or a rug or whatever, those things probably you know, they need to be put away. So principals will have to work with their teachers, classroom to classroom. Um, of course, all of the posters and then these do we share these documents with principals. There's links right to all of the Alberta Health posters. So get those posters up, washing hands, respiratory health, sign on the door here if you're showing any symptoms, do not be coming into school, that kind of stuff. Um, the screening tool will supply that to all their staff. Um, classrooms, you know, we, making sure we increase the space. The DOA is saying, if you can do the two meter thing, great, but if you can't, then put the kids in rows. So if I do cough, I cough on the back of someone's you know, shoulders or head rather than in his or her face. So you know, you're gonna have 25 kids in the room. We can't afford to have a couch in there and uh, all these extra things that are nice to have, but for now, let's let's get them out of the rooms as well and, and have the kids spread out as, as much as possible. So there's some work for them to do. Um, drop up and pick up procedures. Again, to increase that social distancing, um, we want all the kids, you know, in many of our schools, they line up in the morning in their rows, they're all nice ready and they come in. That's, you know, that, that there's no two meter stuff there. So I know a lot of our junior highs and high schools, as the kids arrive, they just go in. So that would probably work for them. You know, we have like arrows and things. So just as you get to walk in, go to your classroom, sit down. But our younger ones, do we line them up outside like in a fire drill, you know, and just spread them out more and then come in various doors? But what about, if someone mentioned, what about a pre-K kids? If they're three years old, are they going to stand outside for 20 minutes lined up? So maybe those parents stagger themselves and they come in you know, maybe 8 30, 8 45, 8 55, just that so those little ones don't stand in the in the line for so long. Those are just things principals need to be uh, make themselves aware. Directional arrows and signs, uh, I think Darren Bursley just received all of them yesterday or the day before. We're going to go to a pilot school on, on Friday putting the arrows in the floors and, and, and the stantier things. And then we have enough for everybody to just kind of try that out. So principals will have to get that organized. Um, what else? <laughs> Saturday breaks of your lunch and recess, eliminating singing and cheering, that kind of stuff. Uh, of 
course, keep a record of all visitors. We do that anyway all the time, but we're going to just continue with that. Um, what else? Phys ed class, right? Again, try to keep the social distancing, but you know, do you need to play basketball where you're sharing the kids are touching the ball back and forth? Probably not. Do other sports where you're not sharing them, like do more line dancing, more boomerang. <laughs> you your own. Um, you know, badminton is okay, there is, is better than wrestling, but then you're still sharing the shuttle. Yes, you can watch the end of the, the grip off the racket, but the, so it's just they need to be creative. How are we going to? We still need to do that. We still need to do these things, but we need to do some different activities. So just things to be aware of. Uh, student develop symptoms, right? Uh, sense parents you bring the parents and. You have to come pick the child immediately. If these symptoms are severe, then we need to put a, a mask on the kid so his or her coughing and droplets aren't spreading around. PPE for support staff, the university also uh, is purchasing more masks and also some shields because some of our support staff are working with you know very, uh, quite high needs children, and so just to make sure none of those droplets are spreading, we'll have to ensure that our our staff are safe. Uh, we decided no hot lunch. I mean, again, the documents are saying that fewer people in the building, the better. So it doesn't make sense to have all the moms and dads coming in and different, you know, there's different groups, mom and dads that come in each day or whatever the day it is. It's probably best to say no hot lunch, right? No hot lunch, kids bring their own lunches to school. Uh, the next page is quickly custodial. There's um, some things that Rob Harrington's team will have to do, and Rob's aware of all that kind of stuff. One concern um, with junior high kids in high school, we have that in our in our pandemic plan, where as you leave your desk, wipe it off before you leave. As I come and sit on the desk, I wipe it before I sit, I wipe it before I leave. Older kids can do that. ECS kids, and we, we have a morning and, and, and afternoon program, we're gonna have to ensure custodians are in there cleaning some of those things ahead of time. So Rob is all over that. Uh, Norm spoke about some of his things, just now about field trips and things. Uh, Darren and I going down toward the bottom, uh, the direction arrows, all those things are here, door occupancy signs. We're staying with our principals and contractors right now regarding our two cafeterias, Volcom and Lucom. We have meetings set up, I think it's for Friday this week. Our contractors of those cafeterias are just like restaurateurs. They have, a, they have definite rules to follow. We just want to make sure they're following all the rules by the GOA and, and, and uh, Alberta Health. And then we want to make sure our principals are also aware of that. <coughs> Even in the cafeteria, you're going to have to have fewer seats in there. You can't have the ketchup bottles. You know, the contractors are going to have to give out packets, right? not sharing stuff. So we just want to make sure we're all on the same page there. And then transportation, we just jotted a few things now, but as Sue mentioned, she and her team are still looking into things like, you know, protective zones for, for the drivers and maybe loading back to front, kind of loading front to back. And so we're sharing this with principals tomorrow, just to give them a little more direction. There's some more things they can start doing in the next 10 days to get prepared for the fall. Trustee Steed. Uh, so if you just go back up to the top where we are talking, you, you said principals. Um, so are all these decisions going to be school-based or district-based or division-based? Because, like, is each principal going to decide how their pre K is going to be managed? Is each principal going to decide their own base, or is it going to be more of a collaborative? This is how we're doing it as a school district and based on elementary, junior, senior, right. whatever. We're going to be a mixture, so like, like, number one, no hot lunch. We decided that. Like, that's, and there, there were a handful of schools that thought, ah, I think we can still kind of manage it. Many were saying, no, you've got to make decisions sometimes for people, right? So those kind of decisions, we said, no hot lunch, no sports, this sort of thing. The pre-K, um, we have what uh, a few sites in Beaumont, uh, and I think two now in the Duke. Those groups will get together. We're encouraging them to talk again, because if, if this school is allowing parents to be staggered and the other school's making those little ones stand outside at minus 15, and there's some of this then, right? So when we speak for our principals tomorrow, we're going to encourage for some of these things with like-minded, get together and, and hear some of our thoughts. But as a team, you guys should be on the same page in the same community. And, but the, the, the main things, I think this group, we are going to make those decisions. Justin Martin. 
Well, I would just like to say that all of our expectations and luxuries that we've all become so accustomed to have been quite, are going to be proving challenging. I mean, life has become so complicated. It's not like when kids went to school back, if, I'm sorry about this, but back in the day, <laughs> when, when kids went to a rural country school, the pump outside was frozen. There was no water. They brought their own juice container or their own service or whatever. And, and you know, and I'm just saying that, you know, all of these things that we have when you, you buy a dishwasher and you've got five different things that can go wrong with it, then one simple thing that all of what you need. So just saying that it's uh, complicated and uh, but we'll get through it. There's all the light at the end of the tunnel. There certainly will be inconvenience. Yeah. Certainly. We are principals already mentioning some of these things but yeah great trustee eckert i was listening to a radio interview earlier this week and it was a superintendent of the calgary catholic board and the the comment he made i think encapsulated very much what we are going to be seeing and we're already beginning to see and that is um, our staff and our students suffering from covid ptsd and um, that really resonated with me. And I think as we move forward, those mental health um, concepts that we discussed this morning, they are going to become very, very much more uh, prevalent. And PTSD is serious, it's clinical. And um, you know, as we go through all of these changes, as you had pointed out, Barb, it's a paradigm shift. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be easier for some than, than for others. Just a little mm -hmm. comment, kind of tongue in cheek, but I really hope it's a mild winter because the kids are going to need to be outside and running around and have that space and have that freedom. So I won't go. Okay. Um, am I correct? This is a this specific document that we're looking at with all of these details for our principals and staff. This is a very fluid document. So. Oh. So hot lunch, for example, will probably be re revisited at the same time as extracurricular activities and some of those kinds of things. Yeah. We just need to give them direction right now. Absolutely. So, and again, right now, the best, let's focus on mental health. Let's, let's focus on getting children back to school and relaxing, getting normalcy, loving their teachers and their friends and the best we can with play. Get some curricula, curriculum in there as we can as well, but really, yeah, focus on mental health and then as Dina Henshaw and others start, you know, relaxing, change, and we can change, but for now, and this is more just internal, right, for all of it. Right. So about a, just getting back to that, about a month ago, I floated the idea out to all the principals saying, we need to start thinking about next year, what are, you know, given that we will probably be having social distancing, what is it going to look like in your school? And what I didn't anticipate was the level of anxiety went through the roof. Um, and what about this? What about that? What about that? So, yes, it did start the conversation, which was a good thing. But there were all of these questions that came up that needed some specific answers. And part of what we've been wrestling with as an administrative team is that balance that you mentioned, who makes the decision. It's easier for us to make that decision and take the pressure off the principal. And in some cases, we've done that. So extracurricular, travel, um, hot lunch, you're saying take that off the plate because you have enough to worry about. There are some things curricular, for example, that I'm not sure we want to take off the plate. So for example, with music, we have actually put it back. We did, at one point, we're considering saying, okay, no music classes because of but we actually put it back on the principals and said, let's talk to your music area specialists. And if they can come up with a program where you can still deliver music within the guidelines, then let's look at doing that. And the same thing happened with foods class because foods class, again, we have people that are in close proximity. So we now have a subject area specialist count, uh, committee with foods people. How can we continue to have foods within the school, but run it in a way that is safe. So some of those things, we are going to make that decision here. Some of them were not, but once that consensus is in, then everybody is going to try and be on the same page. 
locally with each school because of the way they're designed. There are going to have to be some differences, but within the parameters, they have the freedom to make those best choices for their particular school. So I do have one other one just I'm just thinking about bigger picture and future of some of our students. And the thing that comes to mind for me is the football season in the fall. We're saying no to extracurricular sports. What we participate in, like from my understanding, it's called like the Greater Edmonton Sports District for that. What if the rest of those schools or those divisions choose to proceed with the season and our students are not eligible to, you know, that can impact scholarships, that can impact futures for those students. Is that something that has been discussed with other members of that sports division? Is that something that's gonna be revisited? That's just the first one that comes to mind for me because that's coming up very soon. Yeah, great question that we, we had that conversation. Um, well, Cal just sent me a, a text here, um, CTV News just announced U sport, uh, University of Alberta just pulled out for the season of uh, for all the sports that they offer out of the next. So it's not only us thinking this way, it's it, it's happening everywhere. Yeah. So, um, yeah, when we talk about those scholarships, uh, I know right now the scouting is still happening. We do have some students that are already going to identify to go to certain colleges and have been promised scholarships pending whether or not there is a season. Um, you know, uh, part of our conversation was, um, you know, I, I think back to, uh, I was just thinking back to uh, when schools went to work to rule and they didn't offer the extracurricular and the pushback that we had. The pushback that we had was, you know, a loss of scholarships and, and such. The reality is, is that uh, it's not only us dealing with this. Divisions dealing with this, universities are dealing with this, colleges are dealing with this. And, I, we got to come back to what is our primary purpose. You know, that's getting the students back in their schools and making sure that they're safe and attending to this. You know, they've been out of the schools for a number of months here, and how do we re-engage them and get them back there? The whole re entry process, getting them back to the school systems, and that's what we need to focus on. You know. But it sounds like I'm avoiding the, the answer to your question. Like, I, I don't know what the answer is. No, I just don't I'm sorry. But did the ASWA cancel some of its sports here? I thought I just the, the no. spring sports. Well, just the spring set. Yeah. And so. that's, I totally support it. I'm just saying, I, I hope there's reconsideration if the world changes rapidly before November 2020 and we're left behind if all the other school divisions participate or something. I've just, I, I just wondered, obviously I know you guys consider all those things, but I don't want something to be set in stone that we decide <coughs> until November and then who knows? Who knows? Yeah, and the interesting thing is that so again as Cal mentioned ASAA, ASAA had their meeting this week. It gave zero direction. Uh, I think what I think what everyone is waiting for is what is going to happen in July. What will the what will the what will Albert Ed come back with? And I think once that is decided then everybody will follow suit. So we're so everybody seems to be in this same in the same holding pattern when it comes to like elementary, junior high off the table. That's easy. High school, as you mentioned, with with scholarships, that's where it becomes a little bit more of a consideration. And we will follow what ASAA is going to do. Who's going to follow what Alberta Alberta Health is going to tell them to do? So yes, we we will keep that open until. July when we get more information. And also remember though, those kids who are going to receive those scholarships, all those kids play club ball, they, you know, by grade 10 for sure, 11, those universities already know who I'm taking you when you, I don't know if those scholarships go, we're not taking them. If, if, if there's going to be sport, I'm sure they would, those kids are identified nowadays you know, in their club teams by grade 10. So, I don't think it's as big of an issue as it was back in the back in the day, but still a concern. And we'll be we'll be ninjas. We'll be nimble. We'll be ready to change the moment's notice. I think it's going to look like this.
That's all I have. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Thank you for that update. That is, I know probably every statement on that list to come up with, you've probably had to wrestle with multiple questions to get to those points. So, uh, and we'll continue to do so. Thank you. Uh, moving on to 9.1. We didn't actually put policy seven in here uh, because the policy committee has not had a chance to meet since our counting last week where a number of uh, items for discussion came up around policy seven that maybe we need to spend a little more time on. And it sounds like from the discussion, this, and it would have been approval in principle only anyway because we had to put the ward review updates in there from the vote earlier today. Um, so we will take all of that information back to the policy committee and defer this to our August meeting as well, where we have all of that to pull together, if that's all right with all of you. Thank you. 10.1, you all received in your package the highlights from the last community engagement and advocacy meeting. <coughs> you want to facilitate any discussion there, Trustee Eckert? I had briefly reviewed um, the discussion that we had on, on June 8th at our town meeting last week. And there are a few items that I've highlighted on here that um, are decision items for the board to make. So uh, back to the newsletter, I have mentioned that um, we want to make sure that it has widespread distribution. And so Devana, if you would like to speak to something you've started regarding the master list. Uh, sure, yeah. I mean, we had a conversation recently that we would submit, send our newsletter out again by the messenger program to make sure that, that all of our parents are getting the information of what we're up to. Um, but there are additional people in our communities that many of us are sharing the newsletter with. That's important to engage the constituents who are not our parents. Um, and so what I've done is we put together a draft spreadsheet, um, Google sheet, that basically has a a sheet for each trustee and then there's a, a sheet for the chair um, so that we can keep track of the contact information and uh, learn from each other's lists of who our contacts are, our municipality contacts, our FCSS contacts, or whoever those people in your community that you share the newsletter with so that we have a sort of a master template for it. Um, and then perhaps at a Cal meeting in the fall, we can do some brainstorming in terms of um, who else and where else we can get it out to. So sending it to all of our MLAs, are there other people that we want to send it to? Okay. So we are hoping to have a newsletter out this weekend. It just needs a little bit of fine tuning and a recording of some of the decisions made today. Is that um, master list template, is that going to be available to us? Yeah, I can send it out, I can send it out So today. that we can already begin to make I've lists of together. who should see it and where we are sending it and so on. Okay, so take take note of that, please. And the second part of the newsletter is a conversation about how frequently do we want to create a newsletter and distribute it. Um, we have a couple of thoughts on this. One is to do it four times a year, so early in the school year, around Christmas time, spring break, and then in June, so that would be the four opportunities, or to produce five newsletters and send them out every two months. So who, who would like to share what they are thinking would be most beneficial to our school communities? That's a, it's a really hard question because um, it depends what's going on. Like right now, there's so much to say. Um, there's so much, you know, we want to keep people updated on what's going on with COVID and different, and we have the work, we have the work review, we have the, uh, our, we're working on the COVID process, we have so much. And so it, 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 it's really hard to say, to set a specific timeline when sometimes, you know, there's stuff going on, but it's not something that, and then other times it's like, smokes, we need to get this out there and we need it now. We don't want to wait for two months to do it. So I don't, I don't know if we, if we really, 
And I don't know, oh, it's a tough I, one. <laughs> yeah, you're, I think we're on the same page. Uh, my, my thoughts would be, why do we have to lock down? We can do four or five per year. Yeah. Depending on, I mean, we know for sure we'll do one very early in the school year. We know for sure we'll do one at, around Christmas time depending on what happens after that. And we know for sure we'll do one at the end of the year. Mm -hmm. We feel out the middle. Trustee C. Um, I think if we want parents to engage in this newsletter, knowing our regular schedule is valuable for them. Because we can be saying, hey, we have a newsletter at the end of September, December, whatever. I think it's really, really valuable that we actually have continuity consistency. And that's how we're gonna get them engaged and looking forward to it and seeking information and not having it as possibly as many intermittent questions in between because they don't know something is coming. So I think it's very, very important that we actually have a set plan, four or five, whatever, whatever it may be. And my opinion is you can never share too much. So I'd rather see five, I'd rather see 10, I'd rather see more. Uh, Mr. Robachek. So I guess my question to the, to the board would be, what's the purpose of the newsletter? Because we do have, we send out the minutes, we send out the board highlights, as far as keeping the public informed. Uh, we will have a couple of engagement evenings where we can provide <coughs> information to parents and, and bring information back. So, what is the, we, we provide those. I know that there's a lot of the school newsletters will carry that, it's on our website. What's the purpose of the board, of the board newsletter? The purpose of the board's newsletter, in my opinion, is to get our perspective, because none of the things that you had, had said are, the board doesn't write up or doesn't do. This is our our way of communicating. Um, and for me, I like it for, that's what you're right in a sense, maybe we should do it once a month. I like it for when I have um, school council meetings. It's a good reference. I email that with my school council. It's a good reference of what is going on and what things that we want to address. I just think that it's it's just some, it's part of us or in me personally engaging with, with our, with our, I don't know, yeah, so. I do have something I will say. I just I think to go a little bit further, I think that the correct me if I'm wrong, the newsletter is a deeper dive than the board highlights. I do see that they are kind of they're both busy. trying to do the same thing, but they're not. So I think it takes what's in the board highlights and gives more more information, a bit more detail, but in some ways probably does duplicate a bit. I also think it takes it a step further though. From from my perspective, the trustee newsletter is while there is some overlap in the information, it's our voice. Um, and from an engagement perspective, um, if you go to a school council meeting with the board highlights, or if you go to the school council meeting with the exact same information in the trustee newsletter, you get way more engagement and interaction of discussion with the trustee newsletter, even if it's the same information, because it's our voice and the, the way it's presented, the, the level of engagement that comes with that discussion is, is much richer. I also see the newsletter evolving in that, yes, there is this news piece to it, but it's also a great tool for us to, um, to do some of that advocacy piece it sort of t can tie the community engagement and advocacy together and we're not using it that way a lot right now but it had there is the potential and the opportunity there to to state the board's stance on on xyz and and do some advocacy and share that information that wouldn't be included in in board highlights um, that can then be shared with our municipalities with our other constituents um, to to increase some connection and community engagement that way as well Okay. <laughs> no, I just wanted to say I, I've been doing the newsletter for a long time since I began, and you have no idea how many people have. I mean, 
obviously is to a small a small group, but how many parents have come to me and say, I love your newsletter. Thank you for doing that because and they see the board highlights. They get it like it, it's in the package every 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 month, but they really appreciate it. Um, it's just a and you can't over sometimes you have to remember <coughs> things. The more you learn or remember and remember. What's that? Except for exactly. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I was going to say as well that one of the reasons I think a newsletter is a really important venue for engaging is because, as we've seen in other provinces, governments have decided that trustees and school boards are irrelevant. And this is a way for us to say this is the work we're doing. These are the conversations we're having. This is how it impacts your, your students. And that is missed in the board highlights and um, other more official documents. So as you know, I can't think of a better way to say it than to say this is our voice. This is us at work and showing our families and our communities what we're, what we're doing. Go ahead. So hearing that, do we want to do away with the board highlights? Like, do they serve a purpose? Where this is coming from, if you remember, it was a few years ago, there was also something called the pipeline, which I have to try and inherit it, which came out four times a year, which was kind of an overview of the high of the board highlights, which provided some continuity and say, you know, we made this, the decisions were not made in isolation, I guess is what I'm saying. So, and it became a regurgitation, to be quite honest. And we did away with that, slowly phased that out. Is this a time to say that the board highlights have served their purpose? This board wants to have a monthly newsletter, then maybe the board newsletter takes the place of, because we do have the minutes that are that are published. We, we have the board highlights, which are basically the highlights of the minutes or a restatement of the minutes. And now we're gonna go with a newsletter. And I, I'm quite happy to not have the board highlights if they don't serve a purpose. And that's why I asked the question. It's, um, I, I see some redundancy. I, I understand what you're saying is that the information coming from the board highlights is richer and has more context, has, is less formal, I, I, I think. So maybe that's something that we do away with. Or are we just, is it a make work project then? Trustee Martin. And I guess it would depend from board to board because this board could say, yeah, let's get rid of the board highlights. And there's some really eager beavers that want to do this trusty newsletter. And so now you're committed to it, but you come down for or to the next election and perhaps you won't have those people wanting to do that. So then what do we do? And like I said, I, I mentioned or wrote down the pipeline here too that we used to do. And that was more so each department in Black Hole wrote something about you know, student services technology wrote a few paragraphs and it was up of all the black. So, I don't know. And, uh, and also on this master list, when, when this engagement letter goes out, it does it, when you're talking about a master list, does it go out to every parent in Black Hole or does it go to the school council chair? And I know before some of the things that I believe that the board highlights went to the municipalities. Uh, each municipality went out and went out to the MLAs. I'm not sure if that happens anymore. The board, it goes out to, I don't know, I'd have to ask Cindy, honestly. I know it goes out to all the, it goes out to all the principals. I know a lot of them put it into their. And I know, because it, at one time there was a discussion about it was sent out to the Municipalities, but the mayor they are, got it or something. They are, they are sent out to municipalities. I'm not sure about MLAs, yeah. but I do know this is municipalities. Um, I was basically going to say the same as Trustee Martin said, you know, I don't want to see us reinvent the wheel. And I think I brought this up when we initially talked about the newsletter. I mean, we have our board highlights. I do the trustee report for my schools when I can. It's not as consistent as I would like. So I kind of started to deflect a little bit, depend on the newsletter a little more because sometimes it's easier. I think the key word here is collaboration. We need to start collaborating a little better. The board highlights have great value, great consistency. It's some, something that the principals have come to expect all the years. 
I don't want to see that disappear. This newsletter is something that is very active from members of our current board. And a year from now, it could be a very different conversation. I don't want us to lose what we have got of the board highlights. I think what we should be doing now is collaborating on maybe having board highlights version 2.0. So we just wrap it up a little bit more and add some more of those tidbits into it and maintain that consistency. We have to change the name of it so that some people think that it's received differently or better, then maybe that's what we do. But I think this is the time maybe I don't want to see the highlights disappear because I do, I see that my kids have been in all the schools in Beaumont pretty much. And over the years, they've always had a newsletter digitally come to us. I don't want to lose that, but I also agree there's redundancy in a lot of the stuff. So maybe it's now, now the time to just sit and look, okay, how can we just combine these a little better? Trustee Obsi. No, I, and I get totally what you're saying. And I think the, the thing is at school to school because um, I go to all of my parent council meetings and I never see the board highlights unless I bring them. And then I usually forget because I usually have my own thing going on. I haven't actually, I bet you I've read, maybe since I've been a trustee, maybe five board highlights. Isn't, I know that's terrible, but I forget about it. Where I'm, there's so much to read and, and stuff like that. So I should be. Um, and yeah, maybe that's what we need to do is, is cooperate more. I'm, I'm, I'm fine with that. Um, it's just that sometimes it's just nice to have some input in what is being put out there. And so if we want to work together, when, I don't know. And that's why I'm saying you think the board highlights are going out to the people that should be there. Yeah. I, I don't know. Well, we'll try to get an answer to the question about where the board highlights go exactly. Um, yeah, I don't know if that this could go back to the community engagement committee to look at options of how that collaboration could, yeah. what, a, what a merge could look like. And before the newsletter does go out on, we're aiming for a Sunday afternoon slash evening, um, you will all receive a draft copy of it. So if you have any further input, that would be your, your opportunity and it will be welcomed. So Esther, will that newsletter be on our Black Hole Month item? We didn't talk about that. Well, if we send it out on, through Messenger, and if we send it to our targeted people, it, it could, it could not be, I'm not sure. See, when we talked about the Community Engagement Committee, we really talked, I know we had a conversation about media and really connecting with our communities on a larger scale. Um, there's trustees and other divisions that have letters to their local communities weekly or monthly or not weekly, monthly or quarterly, whatever it may be. If this is something we're going to be creating, why aren't we putting it on a bigger scale than we put it in our local newsletter or our, our local newspaper or something? If we're going to put the effort into it, it's just like pages. <laughs> But that includes pictures this <laughs> time. Bill? Nothing says you can't have a regular <coughs> contribution to the local papers. And again, that's part of the communications plan. Um, you know, we had talked at the very beginning about raising the profile of trustees. And part of that was starting with our website where we had all of the bios that were there, updating the pictures and so on and, and getting that. So. That was about the extent that I wanted to get at this year, but I think that's a I think that's a brilliant idea. I think in the past we've sent articles to the paper, and sometimes they print them. If it's a slow news news cycle, and sometimes they don't, but it's up, it's there, and it doesn't cost anything. They use it to save space, and sometimes that will generate some conversation back and forth between the reporter and and, and the individual. So. That might be something on our communication plan for next year. Yeah, and it was something on the radar that was discussed. Yeah, <laughs> was a we're just not ready to do it all yet. But it in the in the template of the contact list, that's one of the questions in there is when and how do we? And I guess if you minutes. sent it into the newspaper, I mean, even if they picked up a few things, that's better than.
That's very good because I don't know that any of us had, you know, as we were brainstorming just in our group, we hadn't really thought about sending it to the rapid Vermont newspaper and so on. And I think that's that's a fabulous idea. Okay, we exhausted the conversation on this. All right. Um just the school visits, we've touched on it that um, we don't know what they're going to look like. And the reason that's highlighted is to make sure that it is revisited in the fall when we have more information. Um, municipal meetings, that's the, the next one that we need to chat about. We have um, three municipalities that we have not had a chance to meet with so far in our term, and that's Kelmar, Thorsby, and Beaumont. So we need to figure out um, who is going to be the person to contact these municipalities and we're looking for dates and times for next year, I believe. We were, we're not going to schedule anything until January or later, so okay. big panic. And, um, so that again, I have highlighted as a parking lot item for the fall of 2020. I just want to make sure that does not uh, fall through. And then the final highlighted item I have is the Community Engagement and Advocacy Committee Framework. So uh, there was some, some conversation about reviewing the terms of reference, um, revisiting our social media guidelines through trustee development and so on. Is that to be referred to the policy committee then? Or how do we review the terms of reference so that we just approved the updated terms of reference for the community engagement committee this morning. Oh, so, so that I obviously highlighted this before this morning. Or this after, <laughs> after lunch, because sure. policy okay. eight was the updated terms of reference. Yes. So, what about the social media guidelines through trustee development? Is that the handbook that someone is, Sean? I think you're working. With? A trustee handbook. I don't know where that belongs. I would say we defer that. My thoughts would be we defer that discussion until we have our communications person up to okay. speed and can help them facilitate that conversation. Sure. Okay, that covers the highlights. The full report is attached to your agenda. So if you have any further questions, um, Mr. Romanchuk, Devana. Um, Trustee O'Gorman and I are on that committee and we will be happy to entertain them until this afternoon. Oh, until this <laughs> I know, but if it's this wonderful, <laughs> we still have to do For sure. Thank you very much. I'm okay. done. Thank you, Trustee Eckert. Um, we added 10.2 staff survey summary. Superintendent Roman Chuck, is that you? Yes. So you have uh, handed out to you. Uh, the beginnings of the staff survey. Sorry, I'm just going to share this. And so what we what we've done with this so far is we've sent the survey um, and uh, we started to disaggregate the information. So I want to just, at the very top, I want to just take a quick look. Um, <coughs> this was sent to all of the groups that are identified there. There is a typo. This is not bus driver. This is bus contractor. Um, so those groups were all part of the survey. Um, depending on which group you were in, you've got more different questions on the survey for the most part. So that was sent out. We got a total of uh, almost 770 responses. Um, and here's the summary of what we got as far as the responses. Underlying health issues that put you at risk. Um, the vast majority, three quarters said no, but 25% did say either yes or preferred not to answer. That was a surprise to us. We didn't believe it would be that, we didn't expect it to be that large, but it starts to put this into perspective as well. And then when we asked the question, does anyone in your household um, have those health risks? It came back to close to, it came back to 30%. So 
the reason we ask these questions is for staffing. And that was one of the things that we wanted to, how big of a job are we going to have next fall in terms of finding substitutes if we have to. Now, this is the entire group, okay? So that's all of those people there. Um, and so that's where the numbers came from. We have not disaggregated yet. Um, do you have daily contact with the public? And of course you would expect it to be almost 100%. Um, division office, of course, probably not daily contact with the public. So we broke it down by grade levels and we start to see some patterns emerging here. What percentage of your students have you been connecting with? So this is for teachers only. So sorry, first of all, very top. Number of teachers who created the video, the total number of teachers when you take a look at this um, was 461. Of the 461, over 400 of them created videos. Okay, so that was something, that was a way to look at it. Take a look at those who use an online literacy or online numeracy, that number comes out to over 400. So a lot of those would be the elementary teachers who are both using literacy and numeracy. And then there would be the subject specific ones. Once you get into uh, division two, three, and four, if I am a math teacher, I'm not going to create a literacy, uh, use a literacy program and vice versa. So that's what we, that's what we gleaned out of there. In terms of student engagement, You'll notice that the vast majority um, where we had, so 40, probably 75% of them said that the students were engaged 50% of the time or more. And when we talked about the EAs, the engagement, again, it was a little more, a little uh, more all over the place. The engagement for the EAs was slightly less. The teacher's ability to support um, remote learning and how comfortable were they? We saw about 20% of the teachers were a little comfortable with that, whereas probably 60% of the teachers were somewhat comfortable and about 20% were very comfortable with the online learning. Educational assistance, slightly more, slightly um, less people that were extremely comfortable, but slightly more that were, sorry, slightly more people that were not comfortable, but also slightly more that were very comfortable with this. So it's encouraging, people became comfortable. And I think I shared back in March, April, that one of the things, one of some of the feedback that we were getting from teachers when we were engaging with them is that they were saying, Learning to do the remote teaching was some of the best PD, some of the hardest PD that they ever had to learn, but some of the best PD that they've ever had to learn because they absolutely had to use it the next day. So that's encouraging. I want to take a look at um, the various statements here. And so if you look at the top, that's our, that's our legend, I guess, as we move down. So the first one was remote teaching has had a positive impact on my students. And you'll notice that for the vast majority of teachers, they are going to either disagree or strongly disagree. They would rather be with their students in the classroom. They're not huge fans of this remote learning. We've heard, we've heard comments that this is not what I signed up to do. This is not why I became a teacher. They want to have that conversation. They want to be in close proximity to their students. I provide timely feedback for all the work I assign to students. The vast majority said strongly agree or somewhat agree. Uh, my students are able, my students are evaluating, are evaluated on their learning. Um, you know, and this is one where kind of I have to say, I'm a little, I need to, we need to break this one down a little bit. 25% of the people said the students aren't evaluated on their learning. And I don't, I don't know what the reasons are for that. So we need to do a, a bit of a deeper dive. That was one that was a little um, concerning to me. 
my students are able to build and maintain relationships with me online. And uh, again, some of that online learning is okay, but it's not the same as being with students in the classroom. Um, I have provided regular online instruction sessions or lessons for my students. Again, we've got some people where it says, I strongly disagree. And I need to go into that because we gotta break that, we gotta find out. But that one, that one to be, that, I never expected anyone. So, I remember going for a driver's. I remember going for a driver's medical when I was driving a school bus, and the doctor asked me, um, "Are you addicted to drugs and alcohol?" And I remember saying, "Does anybody ever answer yes to that?" <laughs> and he said, "Actually, they do." And, um, I, I have to give it to whoever answered strongly disagree. They're, they are. They are strongly. I mean. Ethical, they're telling the truth. They're honest. Um, maybe they misinterpreted the question. I don't know. Um, I have uh, consistently provided online instructional resources to my students. Again, vast number agree. Print or hands on. Um, I think this is, this is a testament to the. Um, yeah, again, I look at that one and go strongly disagree. I'm not sure that there's a. I don't know what that is, but it was. I think what I'm. I think from what we're getting from this is we're finding out that there are some teachers that are very, very much struggling with the online or remote learning, um, and we need to be able to address those concerns before September comes on. One of the things that we did not want to do, or that's not in the, if, if you take a look at what the information that we're sending out to parents. And as Cal said, we could have very easily said, yeah, it's, scenario three is gonna be the same as it is now. It's not. We have lessons learned, and there are things that we are doing to prepare over the summer so that in the event that we have to do the remote learning, it will be better than it has been for the last three months. Some, some teachers have done an excellent job, have been able to make that switch. For some, it has been more difficult. Mm -hmm but we will be providing better resources for teachers and students and parents moving forward. Um, EAs, again, they were asked the same questions and you'll find that EAs had a little bit harder time um, in terms of the online, in terms of the online. The other thing when they were asked, did you provide, did you provide resources to students? Some of them just said no, because the teacher did. So, there was there were those comments that came along with that as well. Um, what concerns do you have for students regarding transitioning into next year? Number one, you'll notice was social emotional. Number two was the gaps in learning, and number three was the screen time. If you take a look at the EAs, you'll find that it's exactly the same. The one, two, and three. Well, actually, sorry, three for EAs was friendships. So these are the things that are important. Those social emotional came up, number one, for both of them. These are the people that are working with students every day. They are concerned. Going back to that PTSD of COVID, we're seeing that. We're seeing the evidence of that. What's your comfort level with returning to your work site? next year with the resources available for teaching next year. And we found with the teachers, it was somewhat comfortable, sorry, comfort returning to school, somewhat comfortable, strongly comfortable. Uh, they want to come back. But there are some that do have concerns, absolutely. With the resources, again, we see that it's skewed a little bit more from the somewhat comfortable to the somewhat uncomfortable we realize that we need to continue to build resources for these teachers. And we're getting the feedback from them now saying, here's, we need some of, we need some stuff here. And we do have, a, we do have a couple of programs that are going to be where we have teachers working this summer to develop those resources. EAs, you'll notice they, they want to come back to school. 
that was uh, that was the strongest response that we got. And you'll notice the bus contractors as well. Let's let's go back to school. We want to be in front of students. We want to be working with students. So that's a, that's a message that we're hearing from those two groups. Those three groups. Probably take this. Um, how important are the following measures when students return to school? And by far the most is the hand washing protocols for sick students, hand sanitizer, enhanced cleaning. All stuff that Cal talked about, these are things that we need to take care of. Masks and engineering protocols are a distant second. And if you take a look at what the EA say, it follows the same pattern. And if we take a look at the bus contractors, again, very, very similar pattern. All the way <coughs> so it's incumbent upon our teachers, the people that are working with our students to really emphasize that hand washing and sanitation. And as Cal said, the extra cleaning that needs to go on. We take a look at what are your major concerns about coming back to the work site. Number one, second wave. We don't want to have to go through, if we come back in an almost normal scenario one, we don't want to have to come back to scenario three. We don't want that second wave. We don't like doing what we're doing now. We would rather be in school. Um, talking about disinfecting and PPE, making sure that it's available. Those were the three most important. We come down to the bus contractors again. The second wave was the most important, PPE, but no other concerns. These bus contractors want to get back to work. And if you'll remember, um, Black Gold was Blackbold was quite generous with the contractors. They gave them that extra month uh, of salary, or sorry, yeah, was salary. It's at a reduced. At a reduced yeah. rate, but an extra month. Um, and the bus drivers, I think, are very appreciative, but they want to come back to work. Uh, just on that, it says other was just as yeah. high response with no concerns. What were the other? Yeah, I haven't, actually, I haven't got into that because they're, 400 pages of comments, and I have not, we haven't had a chance to break them down. This was just, we completed this on Monday. Could come back? I think Monday. I would just be curious to know what. Yeah. Is it, I guess other is there for the others too, but that's like the third. For the bus contractors, it was very important. Yeah. We'll dive into it. It's a good point. I wish I questions. Um, Please, how comfortable are you with each of the following students Students assigned to cohorts and alternate days? Again, somewhat comfortable um, with that. Um, staggered breaks, quite comfortable. Different locations, teachers don't like to leave their classroom or, or their school. They are creatures of habit. And uh, doing both in-person and online learning um, if they had to, they, they would, but it's not their first choice. EAs, you'll find that it's very, very similar. It's parallel all the way through. And with bus drivers, they get to drive the same bus. So it's not a question that they were. They were asked. What, in, what supports do you need in order to feel comfortable coming back? And again, um, Number one came back with the mental health. And so we're hearing that over and over again. The professional development is important. Instructional resources, one, two, three. But it's interesting that the mental health is coming back as number one. And so it was interesting, I, I just texted, I was texting Norm this morning and saying, I think we have our PD plan. <laughs> And on the final page, then, it's going to be 
of the following, what are your top three concerns about returning for work to work and school in the fall? Number one is your biggest concern. And number one, again, for the teachers and the EAs is going to be the uncertainty. And part of what Cal talked about earlier this afternoon, all of those things that are provide that are causing anxiety for our teachers and our principals is we don't know what this is going to look like. A lot of them are saying, just pick a direction, we'll go. This whole uncertainty is very, very difficult for us to, uh, to handle. Um, and you'll notice that uncertainty is both number one and number two, as far as the, the biggest concerns. Um, and for the bus drivers, the bus contractors, students riding the bus when they're ill. That, of course, is number one, and that's quite, it's very interesting. So did a quick perusal of, took a look at this information, took a look at some of the, um, probably read through about 150 of the, of the comments. Teachers are feeling extremely stressed at this time, not knowing what's going to be happening in September. And I would extrapolate that it's probably parents are going to be very, very soon. Part of the reason we're sending out the information that we showed you today is to let parents know and teachers know that we're working on this. We have for the last number of weeks been working on what's it going to look like. So we do, we, we understand. The second thing that came through from the teachers was juggling that what I'm doing in the classroom versus what I'm doing at home. Many of the teachers are also parents. So they put in a full day of preparing classes, presenting classes online, and now I've got to go and work with my children because they've been receiving the same sort of thing online. And that was probably the num a close number two, that, that working with my balancing home and school was very, very important to them. And probably the third thing were the resources. And I think this speaks to the professionalism of teachers. Teachers want to do a good job. What you saw there was teachers who would rather be in the classroom because they know the classroom. They know they can do a good job in the classroom. And I think a lot of them don't feel that they're able to do as good a job in the online, in the online environment, whether that is presenting the material, building the relationships, all of those things that some of our veteran teachers have been doing for years and they're good at. It. They've got to learn a new skill set and that skill set is not as conducive to teaching students as the in-person is. So that's what we're getting from this. And again, this is preliminary. We've, we've had a day and a half to break down 770 responses. So take it with a grain of salt, but those are the big, those are the big patterns that are emerging. We just wanted to share it with you as we move forward. Thank you, Eckert. I have an interesting question. The teacher responses, they're reflecting only about a third or so of our teachers. What happened to the other two thirds? <laughs> Actually, that's about two thirds because there's 666. Oh, okay, sorry. Yeah, yeah I was thinking 1,200 staff, but that's okay, so about two thirds. Okay, so what happened to the other third? Did not respond. Yeah, and I wonder why. I'm going to say because they're juggling home and work and they're <laughs> struggling with mental health and getting their lesson plans out. That's my guess. <laughs> <laughs> Sanitizing <laughs> everything. Okay. No, thank you. I kept thinking about twelve hundred staff, but that's um, okay. And, and some of the some of the responses that we got back, as far as the, the other, were literally a page of response saying, you know, when I'm frustrated with this and frustrated with this, I needed to get it off my chest. Uh, if you're going to do this again, here are my suggestions, and there would be you know, six or eight points, and so. Lots of, lots of good, solid feedback. Mr. Martin, just a comment. For me, some time ago when all this technology took over with the online learning and the remote learning and the video conferencing, 
And it was kind of like, pretty soon, I hope the government doesn't think that we're going to need teachers in front of the classroom because there's nothing, I was gonna say more better <laughs> than a teacher standing in front of a class of students because you know, you can be on the other side of a computer, but you can't, when little Johnny comes to school and he's heartbroken, teachers pick up on that and they see things like that. And there's, as far as I'm concerned, there's nothing better than a teacher standing in front of a classroom of kids than the government deciding that, oh, well, let's go to online and we're learning. This is really working out really well. So yeah, just my, my comment. So what does it say now we can have Somebody sitting in Edmonton doing a course degree, starting at grade seven with everybody wherever. I don't know. Just, just a quick comment, and you said it yourself, Bill. I cannot believe the number of no's and prefer not to say for the first question. That's concerning. And I think that needs to really be looked into. Part of the conversation, of course, we've had with, uh, you know, Norm, Norm has been having weekly meetings with all of the principals and part of the message is you need to talk to your staff and find out who's coming back and who's not. Mm -hmm. And these need to be the one-on-ones. These can't be, you know, okay, in a, in a room like this, who's coming back, everybody puts up their hand. We need to know for sure. And, and there are going to be legitimate reasons, absolutely, there are. Um, and so we need to be able to help those people. The other part that teachers are saying, I don't think I, I don't think I can be expected to teach all day in the classroom and then teach in the evening with uh, those students that are not coming. So don't ask me to do both. Like, you know, there was that plea about and squeeze support their their children, their children, their children in there. Team. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And then I think another thing is that it would only take one one person, one staff member to come to school and then be tested positive for COVID that would disrupt the whole scenario. I mean, if they have to go into quarantine for 14 days and all of the kids that have been in that classroom with that teacher and so on and so yeah. forth. Like it, it, I think a lot of people have to understand too that this online learning is not what it would be if this was permanent. There, everything's been adapted and, and you know this is it's very different. I mean I think if this does if in September online then then maybe we have to really consider more to the other ways of that we're learning like um, homeschool the way they do homeschool here. I don't like uh, because this isn't the same and maybe people think oh this is great because some of them don't have to do anything really it's very little and it, they don't realize that I, and i'm talking that the parents are thinking this great not the teachers the teachers are working there all right so that's why I, this is something too that it's going to be interesting so i think with the um yeah and i think going back there are going to be a couple of things that are different number one teachers did have an opportunity to start a relationship with students they had <laughs> They had months to do that, to start that relationship. Come September, they don't have that opportunity. So we are going to do, we are expecting that we will start with scenario one, but we also know that if that second wave hits, we may need to go to scenario three. It's just the way it is. And we're gonna be ready for it. Kudos to the schools and the teachers though, on top of all of this stuff that we're talking about. There was a parade came to my house yesterday. My son is transitioning schools. The grade five teachers from the next school were on our front lawn getting their pictures taken and doing the Riverview Oath with every single grade five student switching schools. They, our teachers get this relationship piece. Obviously those conversations are, are very clear. And we talk about, talk about this connection piece. We're seeing it happen on top of all the other things they're trying to do right now. They're thinking about those those connections already. So kudos to those out there who are already doing that. Just you know, so. I always play the one that can think a different way. But I have also said from the beginning of this that um, there's a silver lining in this somewhere also in that education hasn't changed for centuries, essentially. For it doesn't, we don't all fit in that box. 
that means we don't all fit in that school classroom necessarily, right? There's an opportunity that we could really roll with this and have some great new learning um, methods that come out long term. I'm not saying everybody should suddenly be remote learning, but there are students that do thrive in that environment that have felt they, they just didn't fit a different way. So I think that you just have to remain positive that there are some great things that come out of this. Like we said about the teachers, they got some great PD and what they did to transition to this remote learning, that enhanced their careers and their futures as well, right? That's an opportunity for them. A lot of people are afraid to take another step in learning. And we should all continually learn throughout our lives. I think this has been a great learning opportunity for every staff member, every community member. So, well said. And I think that just says another thing about some of our outreach programs. It would be for some of those programs. Some of these kids wouldn't have graduated or continued with their school because of just things like what you said. Yeah. Thank you for that update. Okay, there is, I'm gonna guess 15 or 20 minutes at most left in the agenda, but it's been a while since we started the afternoon session. I'm doing a check-in of whether we need to do a bio break. Yes, okay, <laughs> let's take a 10 minute break. That was a pretty clear yes. Get back in. Yeah, <laughs>